uh, metformin, which is the first choice of oral antidiabetic agent that we need to use in a newly diagnosed type diabetes patient unless there is a contraindication. Then uh, sulfonyl ureas are available. There are uh, something called uh, alpha glucose disinhibitors. Then there are meglitinides. Then there is thiazolidine dions. Then there is DPP4 inhibitors. Okay. So some of the examples of DPP4 inhibitors are citagliptin, wildagliptin, linagliptin, alogliptin, and tenagliptin. And there are newer uh, or recent oral antidiabetic agents. Uh, another class is SGLT2 inhibitor. And the drugs that are available that belong to this category are canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, and remogliflozin. And the, the latest kid on the block among oral antidiabetic agents is oral GLP-1 agonist, that is oral semaglutide. So now we will go over all these classes of oral antidiabetic agents one by one. Okay. So we'll start with uh, biguanides. The only drug that, that is available uh, in, the only biguanide that we have is metformin. Okay. Uh, Metformin acts by inhibiting liver gluconeogenesis and it increases insulin sensitivity in other tissues. Okay. This is the primary or the first line of uh, drug that, that is recommended by most guidelines in a type 2 diabetic patient. Okay. So indicated in most type 2 diabetes patients, metformin, when is it contraindicated? If the patient has moral absorption as a lot of GI disturbances because metformin can worsen G gastrointestinal disturbances like diarrhea, vomiting, etc. If the creatinine is more than 1.5, or we can use it up to a creatinine of 2, but above 2, it is better to avoid metformin. We need to avoid metformin in liver failure, be it acute liver failure or chronic liver failure, in patients with cardiac failure, hypotension, or sepsis, or patients with severe B12 deficiency, it's better to avoid metformin. Okay. Since metformin uh, can sometimes cause weight loss, most, in most of the patients, metformin is weight neutral. So already very thin built patients who are losing weight, it's better to avoid metformin. Otherwise, age is not really a contraindication. It can be used at uh, any age. Okay. So metformin, uh, when we are initiating, we ask the patient to take metformin after meal, not before meal. We start with 250 to 300, uh, sorry, 250 to 500 milligrams two to three times a day. We can go up to maximum three grams uh, per day. And once we start metformin, increase the dose gradually every one to two weeks until we get desired sugar levels. Okay, uh, gastrointestinal side effects like a bit of mild diarrhea is common. It's seen in about 10% initially, but it, with time the patients get used to it and actually the frequency of the stools comes down. But in about 5% of patients, there is persistent diarrhea. Okay. So the, it is better to use sustained release uh, forms because they have a smoother uh, release of the drug and less side effects. Okay. Uh, some of the patients on these sustained release preparations come and tell you, they may come and tell you that actually I'm uh, excreting, my, the tablet is coming out in the stools as such. Actually, it is the, uh, the vehicle or the carrier, the drug gets absorbed. Okay, that you need to be aware. So then moving on to the next class of drugs, uh, meglitinides. The, there are two drugs that are available uh, in our country, at least, repaglinide and nateglinide. They are insulin secretagogues, but they are non-sulfonylurea insulin secretagogues. Okay, they act uh, at beta cell levels and stimulate insulin secretion. They bind to a site, a site which is uh, separate from sulfonyl ureas. What are the advantages of uh, meglitinides? Uh, it has flexibility in mealtime dosing because they're short acting drugs. Okay. And the risk of hypoglycemia is less. So it is actually, it's, uh, it used to be called Ram, uh, Ramzan drug or Ramadan drug because uh, patients uh, with diabetes uh, during Ramadan when they're fasting, they can take it only when they're eating and it has a shorter acting, uh, it has a short duration of action. So the risk of hypoglycemia is less and uh, it does not, there's no significant increase in body weight with uh, repaglinide or nateglinide, this group uh, called meglitinides. 
uh, it can be utilized in patients with mild to moderate uh, renal dysfunction. Okay, nitaglinide uh, can be used in even, even in patients with hepatic failure. So, repaglinide, the dosage is, uh, it can be used as 0.5 mg BD2 uh, TID. You can go up to even uh, 4 mg per dose. Okay. The dosage of nitaglinide is at 60 to 120 milligrams per dose. There is lower incidence of hypoglycemia when compared with sulfonylureas. Okay. So, when do we choose uh, repaglinide? In elderly patients in whom the risk of hypoglycemia is uh, a concern, because elderly, as our age advances, our homeostatic mechanisms uh, kind of weaken. The risk of uh, drug side effects are more, and the risk of hypoglycemia is more. Okay, so in those patients, we use drugs with little low potency and lower hypoglycemia. In patients with mild to moderate renal impairment or mild hepatic impairment, they can be used. Okay. So, uh, but we need to remember that this group of drugs, they're, they have low potency. They're not as strong as sulfonylureas. Okay. But they're useful in patients with irregular meal patterns because the risk of hypoglycemia is less. So, what are the disadvantages of this, this group uh, of repaglinide metlutinides? They work predominantly in mild hyperglycemia. Uh, they reduce postprandial hyperglycemia, but they don't bring down fasting uh, sugars that much. Okay, so <clears throat> this megalitonides and alpha glucose disinhibitors, they are, main, they are mainly useful for bringing down postprandial sugars and they are not very potent drugs. They are used when there is mild to moderate hyperglycemia. So we've talked about biguanides, that is metformin, then megalitonides, that is repaglinide and nitaglinide. Now moving on to sulfonylureas, 